Reading out of uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Wow, what a way to start. After all this fuss regarding the doctrine of Christ in our previous study, it would appear as if though Paul is actually downplaying its importance. Well, that is not at all what's going on. As many of you have already figured out, the doctrine of Christ is a foundation, the foundation. And we don't just dwell on this foundation for the foundation's sake. Foundations are for building upon. And so we build our lives upon this foundation. We build our churches upon this foundation. We build our faith upon this foundation. Our faith is based on the doctrine of Christ. 2 Peter 1 verse 12 states, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. All true uh, believers and preachers have, to one extent or another, a love for the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5 verse 20 states, And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. 2 John 9, whosoever, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not, that is, receive, believe, rest in, continue in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. So what is the doctrine of Christ? It is the doctrine of of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ in redemption. Now, for the, fa for the sake of future reference regarding this particular study, we're going to structure this doctrine under the essentials of the faith. And I must tell you from the outset that this study is going to be pretty meaty, and I will often be quoting the scriptures. Number one, first essential, the inspiration inerrancy, authority, and sufficiency of the Bible. That's the doctrine of Scripture. That's an essential of the faith, folks. We have to begin with the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ is the eternal Word of God. John 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This, by implication, makes the scriptures absolutely inerrant and authoritative in matters of faith and practice. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 13, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness doth he ju judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dri dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now there's an aside here, or maybe an implication if you would. There is no separating Christ from his words, as Robert Schuller would have liked us to have believed. Mark 8, verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Next, his word is inspired. His word is inspired. Second Peter 1 verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And of course we have Second Timothy 3.16, the beginning of that verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. His word is inspired. 
His word is authoritative. We're going to take a little time on this one. What makes the scriptures authoritative? Well, number one, Jesus Christ is king. Psalm 2, verse 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Psalm 110, verses 1 and following. Actually, verse 1 and 2. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. And then Acts 2, verse 32, this Jesus, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. He is king eternally. Isaiah 9, verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. He is king universally. Zechariah 9, verse 10. And his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. He is the head of the church. Ephesians 1 verse 22, And gave him to be head over all things to the church. And then chapter 5 verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church and he is the Savior of the body. Colossians 1 verse 18, who is the head of the body, the church. There were many during the English and Scottish Reformations who were martyred for this doctrine. Why? Because it is an essential of the faith. Christ is the head over the church, not the Pope, not King Henry VIII, not Bloody Mary Tudor, or any other civil magistrate or anybody else for that matter. He is preeminent. Colossians 1, verses 14 and following. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominion to principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. John 3, verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. He is Lord, Romans 10, verse 9, that if thou, shalt believe, that if thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Acts 2, verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And a very important side note. You cannot have him as Savior and not have him as Lord. This was the heresy that brought in that was brought in by those in Jude 4 who, quote, crept in unawares, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He is king. He is preeminent, he is the head of the church, and he is Lord. Therefore, his word, the Bible, is authoritative. His word is infallible.
or inerrant. We shall use those two interchangeably for now. Psalm 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Hebrews 6, verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Proverbs 30, verse 5, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. God's word is without error. And note this link. That certainty, that certainty that God's word is without error creates, to one degree or another, confidence and trust in his people. His word is sufficient. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. God's word is sufficient. So we have the doctrine of scripture, the inerrancy, the authority, the inspiration, and sufficiency of the Bible. Number two, the deity of Christ and his humanity. He is God. He is the second person of the Godhead. There is one God, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. And three persons in the Godhead, all of which are God. 1 John 5, verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. And I don't doubt that there's somebody out there saying, well, that's not a part of the Word of God. Well, I believe it is a part of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened up unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven, the voice of God the Father, saying, This is my beloved Son, God the Son, in whom I am well pleased. And you have the Trinity right there in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and verse 17. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and unto all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And no, that word blood there is not used in the sense of family. That's used with the sense of it, the blood that flowed out of his body at his death. The, we, the Greek word haima makes reference to biological blood. And this word was not used symbolically to mean, to reference to family or bloodline. Hebrews 1 verse 8, But unto the Son he saith, quoting Psalm 45, 6, Thy throne, O God, is forever. And ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. That was the Father talking to the Son. John 8 58. John, uh, Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then verse 59. Then they took up stones to cast at him. Why? Because Christ was stating the eternality of his existence 
therefore making himself equal with God or making himself God. He used the words, I am. In Exodus 3, verse 14, God uses the very same name to describe himself, I am. John 8, verse 24 states, I never, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. He is man. Romans 1, verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Philippians 2, verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus fully man and fully God. And let me explain that properly. When I say he's fully man, that means he was all man as if though he was not God at all. And when he was fully God, he was all God as if though he was never man at all. That's the theological term for that. It's called the hypostatic union of Christ. The two different natures existing within the one person in their fullness. By virtue of this, he intercedes between fallen man and a pure and holy God. He is virgin born. Isaiah 7 verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Luke 1, verse 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son. Then verse 34, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? The scriptures teach that he was virgin born, and they teach very clearly that. There is his intercession. For the church, we have, of course, his great high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. And I will leave you to read that. For weak believers, we have Luke chapter 22, verse 32. But I have prayed that thy faith fail not. For his enemies, we have uh, Luke 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Intercession for sinners, where he quote, bear the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors in Isaiah 53, 12. Hebrews 7, verse 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He never stops interceding, and his prayers always prevail. I wonder if we as Christians remember these things throughout our day as we are continuing on through the busyness of our day that he is constantly interceding for us he is also the one mediator the one mediator john 14 verse 6 jesus saith unto him i am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me. Acts 4 verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There is his high priestly work much of which we've already gone over in his intercessions, being that that somewhat overlaps. Hebrews 4, verse 15, For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. This makes Christ's priesthood unique in that none of the Levitical priests were able to do this. And this applies for women also. So there's no need for some female Babylonian, Babylonian pseudo-deity to sympathize with women. He who created the woman 
can do that in his high priestly work. Number three, there is the substitutionary atonement of Christ's death and his obedience. First, his obedience. Number one, it is a purposeful obedience. John 4, verse 34, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And number two, it is a meticulous obedience. John 14, verse 31, And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Number three, it is a loving obedience. John 15, verse 10, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And it is a perfect obedience. Philippians 2, verse 8, Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now note, this obedience plays a major role in our justification, as we shall see. Romans 5, 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so as by one man's obedience, that is Christ's, many be made righteous. So we have obedience. We have the doctrine of imputation. Let's look at the blood atonement. Matthew 26, verse 28, For this is my blood for the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, I want to divert here one moment to remind us that in the Old Covenant economy, the sacrificial lamb without blemish was slain at the altar to atone for sin, which of course was a foreshadow of the death of Christ. Now, I want us to keep a bookmark on that fact for now. Romans 5, verse 6 states, For when we were yet without strength, Christ died for us. Verses 8 and 9, But when God, but God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Hebrews 9, verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, whom through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What does all of this have to do with imputation? Verse 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. God imputed our sins to Christ on the cross, and he became legally responsible now to pay the wages of our sin. But then there's the flip side of imputation. This obedience of Christ is reckoned to our account when we believe the gospel. It is a legal declaration by God. In Romans 4 verse 13 we read, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And then verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted to him for righteousness. The inverse is also true. Verse 8, Blessed is the man in whom the Lord will not impute sin. And if you note in Romans chapter 4, the word imputed appears six times, verse 6, verse 8, verse 11, verse 22, verse 23, verse 24. The word counted is used in verse 3, and the word reckoned appears three times in verses 3, 9, and 10. All the same Greek word, logizomai, counted, reckoned, imputed. Christ gave his entire life and consumed the fire of the wrath of God for our sins to complete our redemption. If there was one verse in Scripture that would summarize this essential, that is, imputation, it would be 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I don't know how many of you have, are familiar with the Scottish theologian Hugh Martin, who had a paraphrase for this. And he stated, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we, who knew no righteousness, might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, that's the great exchange. When we believe, Christ receives the credit for our sin and pays for it on the cross, and we receive the credit for his perfect obedience. That's the very heart of the gospel. Then there is the finality of his work. His work is a finished work. And we go back to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. It was Christ's heaven-appointed goal to finish his work. John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish the work. Chapter 5, verse 36, For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Chapter 17, verse 9, Jesus, anticipating finishing his works, stated, I have glorified thee on earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And then, chapter 19, verse 30, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Remember that lamb slain for the, remedi for the remediation of sin? That lamb then had to be consumed by the fire outside the camp to atone for sin. The Lamb of God, however, was not consumed by the fire, but he himself consumed the fire. That is the fire of the wrath of God to make a complete or finished work of atonement. The lambs of the Old Testament were constantly being consumed by the fire, but not so the Lamb of God. It is a finished work. And now I ask, where is the finished work of Christ in the Roman Catholic Mass? Where Christ is, according to Roman Catholic doctrine, sacrificed afresh time after time after time at each Mass. John Calvin once stated that it is a frightful blasphemy to even think that the work of Jesus Christ is not a finished work. The Westminster Confession calls the Mass abominably injurious to the once-for-all finished work of Christ. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25 to 28, just in case you think that the Bible says nothing about it. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it is appoint, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. There is justification by grace through faith alone. These merits of Christ's work of redemption, his obedience, his atonement, can be obtained only by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Ephesians 2, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're saved by Christ's works, his works of righteousness, his works of atonement. Our works, 
our righteousnesses, Isaiah says, are as filthy rags. Number six, there is the literal resurrection of Christ from the dead. It was prophesied in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that Jesus must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again on the third day. Then Matthew chapter 26, verse 32, But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. There is the resurrection realized. Matthew 28, verse 6, and we're quoting the angel, speaking to the women at the tomb. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where, he, where the Lord lay. In Mark 16, verse 6, be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Luke 24, verse 6, he is not here, but is risen. Colossians 2, verse 12 and 13. Wherein ye are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all your trespasses. There is the importance of it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and our faith is also vain. Verse 17, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. Verse 18, Then they which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Verse 19, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. A lot hinges on the resurrection. But one more thing that hinges on the resurrection, we find in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant uh, practice in the Day of Atonement, where the high priest goes into the most holy of holy to make a sacrifice for the sins of the people on that day. And if the high priest stepped out alive from that most holy of holies, that means that God accepted the sacrifice, else the high priest would have been consumed. And such is the resurrection. That was God's accepting of Christ's sacrifice on the cross and his perfect obedience. There is his ascension. Luke chapter 24, verse 51 and it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Mark 16, verse 19. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and was seated at the right hand of God. And then there is the heavenly perspective of his ascension. Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. In Psalm 68, verse 18, Thou hast ascended on high, and hast left captivity captive. Number eight, there is the literal return of Christ. The literal return of Christ. Acts chapter 17, verse 31 because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Romans 2 verse 16. 
the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Revelation 1 verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Oh, there will be such a unity on planet earth that has never been experienced, especially among the unsaved, because they will all be wailing when they see him. They will all be mourning as one because they'll remember that this was the one, the man whom they would not have rule over them. Well, these are the essentials of the faith. The doctrine of Scripture, its inerrancy, its inspiration, its authority, its sufficiency, the deity and humanity of Christ, his virgin birth, the substitutionary atonement of Christ's death, the finality of Christ's work, justification by grace through faith alone, the literal resurrection of Christ from the dead, Christ's ascension, and the literal return of Christ, the essentials of the faith, the doctrine of Christ. No Christian, to whatever knowledge they may have of these essentials, no Christian will deny any of them. And all Christians come together under the doctrine of Christ. So in our next study, we will be looking at the bounds of Christian unity.